chapter 11 through 21 really has a theme about it. It has a theme that continues on and on. But as we unpack a little bit of this beginning, it's, I want to leave these up here for a few minutes and just go through these, these verses and explain some of the stuff that the Bible is, is packing into this for you to pay attention to and think about. The first is in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. The way the wars would wage is everybody would return back home, they would go back and they would battle again. They would, they would go and they would plant, they would harvest, and then they would go out to battle again. So in the springtime they did that. Now what's interesting is so they, that happens, and David sends Joab, that's his general, and the servants with him in all of Israel, and they ravaged Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, and at such a point when a king who may not be present in the battle would come over a great victory over his foes, David, the warrior king, stays in Jerusalem. Something's wrong here. That's your first indication that something's not right. Here is David who is known as a warrior king, who is, who is such a conqueror, and he stays in Jerusalem. Is he losing a little bit of his focus? And then in verse 2, and it happened one afternoon, David, late one afternoon, David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now you might go, what on earth was this woman doing bathing on her roof? Well, you've got to understand that's actually the most inconspicuous place a person could bathe. Because the roof was up off ground level, and it was very hot in those areas, and so they would, they would have a screen, they would have an enclosure, they would, they would bathe on the roof. But David had a better vantage point. He was up high and he could look down. I had to go and get a bulletin one for the service because I didn't have one up here and for the for the um, for the prayers and it's interesting the vantage point I had in the rear of the church is different than the vantage point from up here. There's a lot of stuff going on during the service. But so then and David sent one and inquired about the woman and what he said, we don't know who it is, but somebody tries to get David back on track and he goes, Is this not Bathsheba? First of all, the daughter of Eliam, you know Eliam, because they have a house right near the palace where David can see it. He says, boy, the daughter of Eliam and uh, uh, <coughs> the wife, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. You know Uriah, the guy who's out in battle with your troops? You know the Uriah, the guy who's a leader of the troops? So much so that when you request a report and have him sent back to you, nobody's going to question that Uriah is coming back. That Uriah, that's his wife. <clears throat> you might, you know, try to get the point, and David doesn't listen. So we see David is already kind of not following God when he doesn't go out to the battle. He's kind of stuck in his own path, if you will. That's why we have that little interchange on there. But what we're going to look at here is a common theme in these passages in chapters, I should say 11 to 21. There's a common theme, and in these chapters, it's, the theme is gateways to future failures. You see, every one of these chapters begins with a, a choice. Or every one of these chapters includes, I should say, a choice. As to which way are you going to turn, which way are you going to go. And time and time again here, and especially David in these chapters, makes the wrong choice. In chapter 11, we have David and Bathsheba, and that whole story. In chapter 12, we have Nathan the prophet coming to David and speaking to him and, and rebuking him, telling him a story about, because you remember in chapter 11, David gets Uriah back. Bathsheba gets pregnant. David says, well, let's get Uriah back so that they'll think that the baby is his. And when Uriah has more integrity than David, when Uriah, because his troops are in the field, when he won't avail himself of the niceties of home, isn't that about the nicest way I could put that? Uriah stays on the, tent, on the palace steps. He doesn't go home. David knows about this and gets upset. He gets Uriah drunk the next night, seeing maybe he'll stumble home. And Uriah still sleeps on the steps of the palace. So the baby is conceived, and, and David sends back Uriah, 
David sends back Uriah with a note to the leader, says, when the fighting gets really fierce, send Uriah out into that section and then pull the troops back from him so he may be killed. So not only do we have infidelity, do we have deceit, do we have murder, this is like primetime TV going on here. This is just in chapter 11. In chapter 12, Nathan comes and confronts David with a story. The story of a, a man who has a flock of sheep, has, is a rich man, has anything he wants, and yet another man who has only one sheep whom he treats like a child. He, he loves his sheep, and David as a shepherd really has a passion for animals. And I don't know how it is in your house, you might have a dog or a cat, you might, I don't think any of you have sheep, but that you really like, and if somebody hurt that animal you, and took that animal, and they had a, have other resources, you would be upset. And David gets upset by that. And as we see the cost of the price, and we'll talk about that at the end. In chapter 13, David's lack of focus on his parenting skills caused all sorts of problems. Amon, one of his sons, has a, a desire for one of his stepsisters, Tamar, and winds up doing unspeakable things. And Absalom makes his appearance in this story, waiting for his father to act. And when his father doesn't act, Absalom takes matters into his own hands and avenges his sister by killing his brother. Again, network TV at its best. Then Absalom runs away and David, David loves Absalom. He says, well, I can't really, I can't discipline Absalom, so we'll just, we'll just exile him from the city. And Absalom in chapter 14 weasels his way back into Jerusalem. And he starts setting up this conspiracy in chapter 15 where he sets up a tent and on the way to the palace where everybody goes to hear the king's judgments, he says, well, stop here. It's, it's a quicker court. It's, it's a lower court, but it's faster. And he starts giving wise decisions and the people start looking at Absalom as a judge and a ruler instead of as David. David's kind of lost his touch, if you will. It was interesting, uh, last week or the week before, they gave President Obama grief because he checked something out in a store and didn't know you could just swipe a card there. Now, a couple of years later, probably six, eight years late, earlier, I should say, they gave George Bush, when he was president, trouble because he didn't understand how checkouts work either. They just don't have familiarity with these things. And so they thought David didn't have any familiarity with the people. Here was Absalom with his people winds up that Absalom then has a coup, takes over him from his father, and David, instead of fighting, because now all the forces belong to Absalom, all the people belong to Absalom, David leaves Jerusalem. He flees from Jerusalem in chapter 16. And in chapter 17, a, a, a leader saves him, Husha saves David. And if you remember the story, David wants his kingdom back, but he doesn't want Absalom killed. And in chapter 18, the general of David's armies does what David didn't have the heart to do. And he takes Absalom's life after his hair gets caught in the tree, if you remember that story. And David is so upset by the death of Absalom that he mourns. He's won his kingdom back, but he's in such grief. And his commander comes into him and he says, basically, suck it up. You have won the kingdom, and your warriors think they have failed you. <coughs> You're not acting like you wanted this victory at all. And so David is called again to account for his actions. That happens in chapter 19, and David returns to Jerusalem, and then there's a rebellion in Sheba in 20, and, and David finally comes back to full circle and avenges the Gip Gibeonites. He, he goes back and he's back in battle again. And it's almost like a whole circle takes place in these chapters. But let's, after understanding that time and time again decisions are made and bad decisions are made and, and people go astray, we go back now to the very first problem. What was David's first problem as he stood on that roof and he gazed at Bathsheba? His first problem was he didn't turn away. An opportunity to sin was presented to him, and he took it. 
instead of turning away, instead of saying, maybe I should warn Bathsheba that she's visible from the palace, he finds out more about who she is. This is the painful part. The painful part of, of we all face when we find ourselves in trouble is recognizing and acknowledging our sin. This is what happens in chapter 12 when Nathan comes before David and tells him that story of the sheep owners. And David gets upset and says, surely that man must die. And Nathan responds to David, you are that man. I don't know what it takes sometimes to get us to acknowledge our own sinfulness, to acknowledge our problems. <clears throat> sometimes it's a medical thing when we, we pay the price for our past abuse of our bodies in one way or the other, and the doctor calls us up short. Sometimes it may be in a relationship that we have rendered so badly that it cannot be restored. People don't talk to us. People don't call. We, we, we wind up isolated. It may be in our relationship with God that we've... God has called us to go out to war and we've stayed in the town. God has called us to be faithful, to go out for Him, and instead we've wiled away our lives looking at sinful things and, and seeking our own desires. The painful part, the most difficult part, is recognizing our sin. It may be that you've, you've gotten to a point where you go, how did I get here? How did I get to this point? Where did, the, where did it... Where did this misdirection begin? And so once we recognize it, now comes the hard part. This was hard for David. We see again and again. The hard part is changing our path. David gets, gets this smack in, into his face at, with, David, with Bathsheba. He made a bad decision. And again, he continues to make bad decisions with his kids all the way through. And it cost him. And it cost his kingdom. And he doesn't, doesn't recognize what it's going to take to change or how hard that change is. It's hard for any of us to make a change, to admit our sinfulness, to, to confess our sins to one another, to come to somebody and say, I was wrong in what I did. I apologize and I repent. That's humility that we need to have as Christians because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if that's the hard part, there is a good news part. And the good news is that we serve a God who forgives and restores. And so in our sins against God, we have a God who not only forgives us, but he restores us. You may have heard the words, I can forgive you, but I'll never forget. That's a human way of forgiveness. And it's not really forgiving if it's not for God. God forgives and forgets. He forgives us and he sends our sins as far away as the east is from the west. And so when you come before him, having sinned again, having fallen again, and you say, God, here I am again, he goes, when were you here before? He doesn't remember our sins when we have repented of them and when we have cast them away. That's the good news of the gospel. That's, that's the love that Christ has for us. That's Jesus on the cross for our salvation. It is important for us to remember this. When we think that the pathway back is too hard, when we think the change is too difficult, God is right there. When we turn, He takes us in His arms. And He restores us and He walks us back. If we will follow Him. But unfortunately, we are often like David who repents and, and tries to restore our path and then we forget about God and go our own way. After September 11th, the churches were full and people were praying to God and, and as we've gone past that now and years go by, little by little, the people go back to an old path rather than stay with the new. The good news here is that no matter where we find ourselves, when we ask ourselves, how did I get here? The answer to how we get back is always the same. It's through the blood of Christ.
He has restored us, he has cleansed us, and he invites us to walk with him again. To be with him, to live with him, abide with him, to listen with him. For he loves us beyond our measure. Well, there's one thing I want to do, and, and I apologize because this is going to take a few seconds, but there's a gospel moment that we really need to mention, and it's in 2 Samuel 12, and I would urge you to write that down and remember that. Remember that for second or that chapter, 2 Samuel 12, because it comes in hand, it comes in handy for a lot of heartache that people may experience. 2 Samuel 12, we find David and Nathan in, in their conversation, and David's repentance of, of I have sinned, I have I have destroyed Uriah, I have sinned, and Nathan and God sinned. Through Nathan, tells David, okay, your, your life is not going to be required of you, but the child you have with Bathsheba will die. Boy, that's harsh. Says the product of this sin will die. The baby is born, and if you remember now, this coming Wednesday, we have Christ in the Passover. We have Jews for Jesus coming. And, and please join us at 7 o'clock on Wednesday for the Jews for Jesus presentation of Christ in the Passover. 45 minutes that will open the scriptures to you, if you will. But let's open them right here. Because when the baby is born, David starts praying con intensely, continuously at the temple. He comes before God, or I should say in the tent of meeting, he comes before God and he prays and he prays and he prays because the child is sick. And if you remember in Jewish culture on the eighth day, a male child is circumcised. It's an indication of his being bought, brought into the covenant of Abraham, of his being a child of God. And David prays and prays and prays and on the sixth day, his son dies. His advisors are afraid because David has been so distraught over the sickness of his son, they don't want to tell him the child has died. And so they, they stand in the back and they, they kind of say, the baby died. And David hears them whispering and he goes, is my son dead? And they say, yes. They're concerned because if he was so upset when the child was sick, how will he behave when he finds out the son is dead? And David does something surprising. He gets up and instead of tearing his cloak and putting on sackcloth and ashes, he cleans himself and he dresses. And they go, we don't get this. That's a Smith paraphrase of the Bible. <laughs> we don't understand this. And he says, while my child was alive, I prayed to God that he might save him. But now that he has died, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. Now this is a child who is not circumcised. This is a child who isn't bought into the covenant of Israel through that circumcision. And yet David, we know David is in heaven because God loved David. And if God loved David, he can love us. But God loved David. And he says, guess what? I will go to be with my son. Now, why is this a special gospel moment? This 2 Samuel 12 speaks to people who have experienced miscarriages, speaks to people who have had stillbirth or have had children die before baptism. You see, the intent of David was to bring that child into the kingdom of God through the rite of circumcision. We now have the rite of baptism. God has given us a better covenant. But what happens if a child is born or is not born? Or comes into this earth, not alive. Or comes in, I should say, comes forth, not living. We can offer hope and comfort because of 2 Samuel 12. We can offer the knowledge that as you desire for that child was to be with God, God will honor that promise. God will honor that desire, I should say. This gives us hope and allows us to share hope with those who may be experiencing a tragedy that. that that is beyond all others, the loss of a child. So as remember this passage, 2 Samuel 12. Read it and try to and, and, and look through it through those eyes. And therefore, if you know somebody who has suffered this or somebody who goes through this, you can present them with a hope in a time of crisis. You can present them with assurance in a time of, of confusion.
as we go forth this day, we, may we always share the gospel and do it in ways that the people can understand and do it in ways that direct their paths back to God. May God be with you this day and each day.